Hi everyone, I wanted to welcome you to the FUSE webinar for July of 2016. Um, we've got a lot of attendees together and we have a lot of speakers today, so we're going to go through this pretty rapidly today. Um, this is Chris Decker, I serve as a FUSE FDA liaison, um, and we'll be going through uh, an agenda today and providing you an overview of what was a, a very exciting and energizing event that was held in Basel, Switzerland about a month ago. Uh, after five years of the computational science uh, collaboration and symposium being held in Silver Spring, Maryland in the United States, uh, we made a decision to have a first inaugural event of the same type in, in Europe this year. Uh, so today we're going to, I'm going to give you a short overview of that event and then I'm going to ask a number of our, our co-leads of our various projects to give you a quick summary of what was covered in this, in this, uh, in this uh, event that was held in Basel. So again, a lot of speakers in an hour. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, everyone is on mute. Uh, so if you do have any questions during the course of any of these presentations, please enter them in the chat window of your go-to uh, window and our moderators will uh, provide those to us uh, so that we can answer those later on, assuming we have time. If not, we will follow up with all attendees with the answers to those questions. So let me first just quickly remind everybody about the computational science collaboration. Again, it was initiated five years ago with the goal of providing a transparent and non-competitive environment where regulators, industry, technology, and academia could come together and work on addressing some of the issues and some of the innovation, uh, introduce some innovation to the drug development process with the goal of ultimately trying to bring safe and effective products to market quicker. So that was the mission and we've been uh, on this, uh, this winding path in, in for the last five years. The computational science collection, uh, the meeting in Basel kicked off with two keynote speakers. So it was a it was a shorter meeting. We had an afternoon uh, where we had some keynote speakers uh, as well as a, an introduction to the working groups and projects. And then the, the projects rolled their sleeves up on the second day and really got to work collaborating on the various activities which everyone will describe later. But I do want to mention that there was two great speakers uh, at the event. Um, Amanda Rodrick, if I say that right, is from the University of Oxford uh, and is a doctor who has, has dedicated her, her life and her research to helping uh, rare diseases and she was actually gave a wonderful presentation on the Ebola virus and her time spent uh, combating that a few years ago. And it was really amazing some of the data and information she shared and encouraged all of us to, to continue to remember why you know, we, we do the jobs we do every day. Uh, and then Lillian Rosario from the FDA was also there. Uh, and, and gave a really good talk about how we need to collaborate as a group and, and put our effort forward to, to make these changes and things happen. So a good kick, a great kickoff to our meeting and everybody was energized. We had about 120 people there uh, over the course of five or six projects. So as a, to remind everybody again, we have five working groups uh, within the computational science collaboration uh, and I won't go into detail on each of these. But we had projects that touch uh, on all of these um, all of these groups, in addition to another project or two across other FUSE uh, projects and initiatives. We have a steering committee which oversees these projects uh, and makes sure that we have alignment both within the groups and the projects as well as with organizations outside of FUSE, such as HL7 and CDISC uh, and FDA. So why did we go to Europe? Well, FUSE is a global organization. It always has been and has grown to over 6,000 members. Uh, the challenges that we were addressing in the computational science collaboration are really global, global challenges. Some impact, initially it was, it was kicked off as a collaboration with FDA, but as it's grown with over 30 projects, we realize half of those projects uh, really aren't specific to a regulatory agency uh, or to the US. They cross boundaries of all the issues and challenges that we face. Uh, in addition, the e, we've had EU colleagues make significant contributions to this engagement from being co-leads, members of our steering committee, 
and so on. And we've had over 20% of our attendees actually cross the pond and come to the conference in, 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 in the U.S. So we thought it made sense to hold a similar event over there and continue this collaboration throughout the year. And I think overall it was a resounding success. Uh, and we plan, or we are in the, in the first stages of planning another event for, for next year. So to go over the project, so as I mentioned, as I mentioned uh, before, we have working groups, and each of those working groups has anywhere from two or three projects to eight or ten projects, depending on the working group uh, uh, teams. So what we decided to do at this event is really identify a subset of those projects. So we wanted to make sure the event was a smaller event. We wanted to make sure we were, we were pushing forward specific uh, initiatives. So we identified about six or seven projects to work on during the course of this event. And those included, and I'm going to go through these very quickly because we have people who are going to talk to these, to these projects. Uh, the first is the SCE experiences. For a minute. Uh, where we continued the development of an ideal SCE framework. The second was the alternative transport formats where we were looking at publishing and evaluating criteria for an alternative future format. Non-clinical topics, um, and again, I'll let that group talk about those. And uh, a new project in SDTM Atom implementation, which I'll actually talk about near the end of this, of this session. Finally, we had uh, the de-identification of Atom data sets. So this continues to push forward our efforts around um, data transparency. And then the last one was one of the future forum projects, which is our new collaboration uh, that we initiated over a year ago. Um, and um, this is focused on process optimization. So at the course of the week, we kind of had these quotes in our head about really innovating and, and, and working together um, and putting effort into being innovative and figuring out ways to um, change the way we do things with, with an industry-wide collaboration. So these are, these are some quotes we put up as we all charged into, into the efforts. Um, as I mentioned before, the event had an overwhelming um, success. And as I said, we're planning a second event, uh, on, on the next uh, second annual event in Europe, uh, probably in the June timeframe. Uh, probably within uh, the London area, but we'll have more information for that to come. So I'm going to stop talking because I really want to hand it over to the project teams uh, who are going to talk through um, their work in the different in the different projects. So I'm going to, uh, if I go back to my agenda very quickly, I'm going to hand it over to Nigel Montgomery from Novartis, who's going to talk to the statistical computing environment project. I'm handing it to you right now, Nigel. Hopefully you will get it and have you come off mute. Hi, Chris. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine and I can see your presentation. So you are good to go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, everyone. For those that don't know me, my name is Nigel Montgomery. I, I work here at Novartis in Basel, Switzerland, uh, and I am the co-lead of the SCE project within the Emerging Trends and Technologies Working Group. So I work together closely with Steve Madison, uh, who's a fellow co-lead, and with Art Collins, who's the lead. So I'm presenting today as I was the chair of the SCE workstream at the EU CSS. Okay, so we very much wanted to build upon the work that we, uh, I say we, I wasn't there, in Maryland, uh, Washington, CSS in March. Uh, there was a group of people that, that attended this that put together uh, the SCE framework. Uh, and I've been calling these pillars or building blocks. So we have acquire, transform, analyze, visualize, and de deliver or delivery. Uh, and they also put together high level user requirements and user stories. So you can see a very high level diagram at the bottom here, very colorful diagram. Uh, which represents these these five pillars. So the acquire is actually in blue, uh, the transform is in red, the analyze and visualize are in green, 
and the deliver is in black. So that kind of gives you a high level overview of the of the schema or the framework uh, that was put together in Maryland. So again, we very much, much wanted to build upon this at the EU CSS, and this is what we set about trying to do. So we had, within the SCE work stream, we had 26 people registered. However, on day two, we only saw 17 attend. I don't know if it was something I said on day one. Nothing taken personally, but we, we had 17 attend on day two. Uh, after the very brief intro session on day one, it became very apparent that we had a diverse group of attendees from different backgrounds. Uh, by different backgrounds, I mean we had people from application vendors, from CROs, from pharma companies. Uh, and of course, we had uh, lots of people with different experience. So I think the range was from three years of experience all the way up to 26 years of experience. Uh, we used the SCE roadmap. So this was developed by the SCE team. Uh, and we used sample cases that were prepared by the SCE project team to give us all the target to strive for. So ultimately, in the end, we wanted to produce as many use cases as we could possible on selected pillars or building blocks. But we had these sample use cases prior to the, prior to the uh, work stream. So what did we do? Uh, I, I'd summarize day two. As Chris mentioned, day one was a very short session. We had a, a brief intro on day one, followed by introductions. But day two was the main, the main part of the EU CSS. So day two consisted of uh, we had two use case or user requirement brainstorming sessions. So in parallel, we had stream leads uh, that were grouping these brainstorming notes or, or uh, use cases into overall groups. Uh, we had this in, interspersed with uh, discussions on unique considerations and best practices. And we, fin uh, we finished with uh, a fin to finalize the use case or a summary session at the end of the day. So as I briefly touched on earlier, uh, the aim, ultimately the aim, we wanted to produce two to three use cases for each of the following areas. So data acquisition, data transformation, planning and tracking, and system. So I think for, you, for the eagle-eyed people among us, I, I think uh, you, may have, uh, you may have seen that planning and tracking and system were not part of the, the original building blocks, and that's a very valid point. Uh, but we thought that the, the addition of these two uh, pillars or building blocks kind of completed the full picture. So we, we set about adding these, and we, we thought we could focus on these two new pillars. Uh, and also, we wanted to produce a list of best practices uh, and produce a list of unique considerations. So the the use cases, sorry, I forgot to refer to the template that I have below. We use this template as uh, a guideline uh, for the use cases uh, that we were to put in place. So did we meet our aim? Uh, I'm going to show you right now. So. Uh, Unfortunately, we, we were a little bit ambitious, it, it would seem. Uh, we, we, perf uh, we were able to produce two use cases for data acquisi acquisition. We produced half a use case for data transformation, uh, simply because this was uh, the, the group were rather smaller than the other three groups. Uh, we, have, we produced two planning and tracking use cases, and we produced a system use case also. Uh, we also put together some best practices and some unique considerations. We had the open discussion uh, that was in between the brainstorming sessions produced uh, some very interesting topics, and we jotted down some notes from that. So uh, I'm showing here, I, I understand that this is very hard to read. It's the best format I could, could obtain. But this is one of the use cases produced from the Acquire work stream. So the Acquire work stream was being uh, led by Dante Di Tommaso, who's part of the SCE uh, project also. Uh, and the Acquire work stream put together two use cases. This is one of them. So uh, 
again, I won't go into too much detail, but as you can see, we followed the template from the previous slide, uh, and we tried to put as much detail in there as possible with regards to descriptions, uh, actors, preconditions, process and steps, outputs, and post conditions. So I think uh, hopefully you get the gist of, of uh, what a use case is and how we try to fulfill uh, the, the template. So I think finally this is my last slide uh, and I know we're pushed for time. So uh, the next steps for us now. So uh, the EU CSS team, so that would be my sofa's chair and my co-chairs, need to complete the documentation and I realize uh, we've been a little bit slow on this but uh, we've had various people off on vacation uh, to complete the documentation on brainstorming and use cases uh, and the open discussion and share this with all the attendees and the SCE project. So we're, we're most of the way through that and we hope, we hope to share that within the next couple of weeks. Uh, on top of that, the SCE project uh, are implementing smaller teams to further progress the creation of use cases. Uh, so as you can see, we have now the, the seven pillars listed below with people assigned to uh, as leads or contributors. But you will see that we do, uh, on several occasions, some of the pillars are not uh, populated with leads or contributors. So I, I think this is an open opportunity for people to get involved. If you're interested in joining the team or interested in contributing, to such use cases on each of these pillars or building blocks, then please uh, please come forward to myself or Steve Madison or Art Collins. I, I think any help we can we can get here is is uh, happily accepted. And lastly, uh, the the target. I know perhaps this is a slightly ambitious target also, is to create at least two use cases per area by the end of August. I think it's ambitious because, of course, August is vacation time. So, but it's a good target to aim for, and this is this is a, this is our target we're going to strive for. So I believe that's everything my end. I won't take any questions now. I think Chris mentioned that uh, questions would come at the end, so I will pass yeah. over to Jeff Lou. So while Nigel's, thank you, Nigel, while Nigel's passing over to Jeff, um, again, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box, and we'll try to answer them at the end or after. Um, Jeff Lowe's from, from Metadata and serves as a co-lead on our um, Emerging Trends of Technologies group, uh, and he'll be describing this project today. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Nigel. Um, yes, I want to talk very briefly uh, about what we got up to at the European CSS, the... Um, just to, to give a quick overview of the scope, so we've got two phases in this particular project. Um, what we're aiming to try and do is put together a, a, a case or a business venue exposition to say that we could replace SAS transport with some other format of transport um, for sending clinical data about, not just for submissions, but for wider scope. Um, to do that, we're, we're trying to find out uh, what the problems might be with existing format, and then we're trying to work out how we could, uh, for a, a given number of criteria, come up with sort of a, an almost objective uh, evaluation criteria set. Um, the way we're doing that is putting together sort of a, a blue sky set of criteria, um, and then we're going to send this quest uh, questionnaire out to the wider industry to, to give us uh, basically what, what people's ranking is, so is something very important or not quite so important. So that's going to be phase one. Phase two, we're actually going to take some examples where we actually load data that's already in a test transport file as an example, um, and then evaluate it against these criteria. So at this particular session, um, we had a lot of new people. Um, so quite a bit of the session was it's been catching people up, um, giving them a chance to, to review some of the criteria that were put together. So the criteria were put together themselves over a series of calls, as well as the um, main CSS event in Washington. Um, so we started off by just walking through the different criteria themselves, you know, making sure people were happy with the uh, basically the de definitions, um, uh, tried to provide some examples as and when possible, and then gave a couple of examples of how you could essentially test the criteria um, to assert some sort of uh, basically success or, or failure of any given format. Um, we also, uh, so to, 
to undertake the questionnaire, we reverse the need to put together, put together a questionnaire and then publish it. So we spent some time looking at what sort of metadata do we need to include with the questionnaire itself um, to help us categorize um, the, the result of responses. So some responses uh, are by people who are practitioners, other responses might be people who are managers who don't actually have any day-to-day -day, uh, contacts. So we want to be able to categorize the responses. So we spent some time on the, the questionnaire itself. Um, looking at how the questions were phrased and the, the, the metadata questions uh, and whether or not we, we thought we'd be able to get enough sort of definition between the, the different responses themselves. And then also we had some discussion um, amongst the group in terms of how, we, how would we analyze the res responses, um, what do we expect to receive. Um, should we be using some sort of scale or will we just ask, be asking people to pick their top favorite, uh, top five favorite criteria? Um, so some discussion went on about that. Um, I planned to do that um, and we managed to really blitz it through most of it sort of an hour or two after lunch. Um, so we just had some other discussions about where we thought it could go. Um, so it was a very successful event from our perspective. Um, the next steps, uh, we've had a, another couple of calls since to talk about the, the questionnaire itself. Um, I need to spend some time actually putting it into something like SurveyMonkey and then sending it out to a few first responders to see what people think of the question, whether they find it easy to work with, whether the, the information that we get out of it makes sense and is easy to do some sort of analysis on. Um, obviously, once we've road tested it, we then need to send it out. Uh, to collect all the data itself, and sort of in parallel, we're also working on the white paper to talk about our rationale and how we put this all together and wh why we did what we did. And that's short but sweet. I'm going to pass it on to Khalid. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, Khalid is now going to join us and talk about the uh, Adam Anonymization Project. Thank you. Um, just trying to get Webex to um, share my screen. Um, while it's doing that, let me uh, let me get uh, started. Um, so uh, I'm um, uh, Khaled Al Imam. I am here presenting on behalf of Jean-Marc Ferran, who um, is the lead for the uh, anonymization working group. Um, and um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes, okay. we can see it. OK, excellent. Um, so um, this is the set of participants who um, were, uh, uh, who came to this session. Um, and uh, um, so, so we had 14 uh, participants. We also had. Uh, two members uh, from the uh, uh, disclosure group at the EMA joined us by telephone for the first half day uh, to provide feedback uh, and input on um, our various uh, discussions. Um, so uh, uh, we, we had a, a cross-section of companies um, who um, uh, and individuals who, who have been with the group for some time and there are also a number of new members who joined the group um, at the uh, session in, in Basel. So there's uh, uh, increasing interest in the activities um, of, this, uh, of this group. Um, and just on the discussions with the EMA, so absolutely fantastic discussions with the EMA team. It's very valuable to have them uh, connect remotely and provide uh, input and feedback to the various uh, issues that were being uh, uh, covered during that first half day. Uh, so this was the uh, uh, agenda. Just gives you gives you a sense of the uh, topics that were uh, covered. Um, so uh, there's discussion about policy 70 from the European Medicines Agency and the uh, anonymization of clinical study reports, um, and the uh, discussion of uh, risk assessment, which is a requirement uh, in the uh, EMA guidance. Um, and then uh, followed by that discussion of how to anonymize narratives in clinical study reports, uh, different techniques, manual and automated, were discussed uh, there as well. Um, 
and then we had a discussion about data utility and how to maintain data utility in anonymized uh, documents and anonymized uh, data. Um, and then um, we covered um, the contents of anonymization reports, which is uh, uh, again a requirement by the EMA to, to submit uh, anonymized clinical reports. You have to produce an anonymization report. So um, there was a presentation of some templates uh, for these anonymization reports, and these were discussed. Um, and uh, one of the uh, existing projects by the anonymization working group or identification working group is, is around Adam, so that's the standard for the identification of Adam data. So uh, one of the topics was handling imputed data in Adam, um, and then a discussion of uh, Adam data identification scenarios uh, uh, kind of closed off the, uh, the day. So broad section of topics um, covering documents and covering uh, 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 Adam data. Um, so uh, some of the key uh, highlights, um, try to kind of pick some of the main ones are on policy 70. Um, so um, some technical issues about definition of the population um, and uh, how do you evaluate uh, data utility to ensure you have not anonymized uh, too much. Um, trying to get some sense from the EMA about when they expect um, phase two or part two of the policy to be implemented. Um, and uh, not anytime soon was, was essentially the answer. Um, discussions of narratives. Um, so uh, again, multiple different perspectives about how to anonymize narratives and do it in a manner that will be consistent with EMA guidance and ensuring data utility. Um, discussions about uh, manual methods and natural language techniques, automated techniques, uh, and uh, whether the uh, narratives can be generated automatically uh, from anonymized databases or whether they have to be written manually and then anonymized afterwards and the pros and cons of those different approaches. Um, then again, discussions about data utility, how to measure it, how to define it, the multiple perspectives around data utility, uh, uh, templates for anonymization report, um, data offsets were discussed also quite a bit, different techniques for, for offsetting dates um, and uh, some more, more coverage uh, of that. Um, so um, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, SDTM identification standard that we produced, uh, was published last year, um, was uh, had Appendix 1 which uh, contained a guideline for uh, date offsets and um, there's a plan to uh, update that. Uh, with uh, dis uh, to include a discussion, uh, just clarify a few things, uh, and also to include a discussion about dealing with uh, uh, partial dates um, and uh, uh, dealing with, with, with how do you deal with partial dates with some with some examples, uh, and and also the consequences of um, the, the proposed approaches for dealing with partial dates. Um, and then uh, there are also s s some ideas on how to deal with the uh, offsets in the context of Adam. Um, and uh, the current strategy is uh, for partial dates to uh, uh, set them to null in, uh, in Adam uh, files uh, rather than try to uh, essentially impute them and then offset them as we do in STTM. Um, the other approach, of course, is you, if you offset dates in STTM and then generate the atom data from that, then, then they're consistent. So, so that that's another will be another acceptable approach. Um, so here's a here's a, a basic uh, example. Um, so um, the uh, you have a uh, some partial dates. Uh, you would use the middle uh, of the month or middle of the year um, as an actual date. Uh, and then you'd apply the, the uh, uh, offset, and that's how you would keep it in SCTM. Um, and then for Adam, uh, you would essentially remove the uh, imputed dates uh, and, and, uh, uh, leave and, and, and uh, 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 set it to null, basically. Not null those dates in, in an Adam file. Whereas you keep the, the, the imputed offset dates within STTM. And this illustrates the idea that, that was developed. 
Uh, there's also a plan to, uh, there, there have been quite a few uh, downloads now of the SCTM identification uh, document. Um, so the, the plan is to um, develop a questionnaire and do a survey of the folks who downloaded the document uh, to get a sense of um, uh, what they found useful, what can be strengthened, what can be improved, um, and uh, which, which elements need to be uh, developed further. Uh, and also asking about implementation experiences uh, fr from the standards. So uh, this is a, an example of the types of questions that are being considered. Um, and then uh, the expectation is that this questionnaire will be rolling out <coughs> uh, quite soon um, to, to the folks who downloaded. Because we get the email address of everyone who downloaded the document so, so we can conduct such a survey. Um, so in terms of immediate next steps, um, the uh, uh, we have the update on the date offset issue, some clarifications. So the expectation is this would be uh, completed over the summer and sent out to all the folks who already downloaded the uh, the standard or the document, uh, and then send them the que everyone a questionnaire as well. Um, a couple of uh, uh, publications are are planned, uh, starting off with uh, writing some blog pieces, uh, specifically around uh, policy 70, and there's ongoing work around the Adam Data Identification Standard. Um, and the, the plan is to have a draft uh, in the fall uh, and then send that out in uh, uh, by the end of the year for, for public review um, and then depending on the feedback maybe completed sometime early early next year um, so that's uh, that's all we had thank you thank you Philippe. yep you'll hand it off to Philippe and if you write you just right click on his name and say make presenter and Philippe from Novartis, Philippe Mark from Novartis will be talking about uh, the non-clinical group and what areas they cover. Yes, thanks. Um, so I'm Philippe Marc. Uh, with uh, GitHub Housing, we did organize the non-clinical topics part. So what is the non-clinical topics? Well, it's basically about sand, and the part of SDTM storing the, the animal data, the toxicology, basically. Um, so it was the first time there was anything in Europe for that, actually. Uh, there was no one-day event or anything for the non-clinical part. So we decided to go for really something to, to get the committee to meet together, actually. So we had four breakout sessions. One, the final one, was really about discussion for the future. Uh, the, the first one was actually about what's going on with the agency. So we had the, the luck to have uh, Lydia Rosario uh, in Basel uh, speaking about what's going on with the FDA. And it's interesting because well, uh, we had uh, the e-data e submission uh, test. Now we have the fit for use test, which is really um, an upload of the data to the FDA with real reviewers from the FDA looking at the data. Um, and we all agreed to share the outcome of that actually uh, uh, in September when it will come back. So for Novartis, we just submitted last Monday. So now our data are there. And uh, well, let's see what's going to happen. Um, that's very interesting because it's really very collaborative actually with the FDA and it's very nice. Uh, we had the luck also to have somebody from the PMDA on the phone, Yuki Ando. And um, it's interesting because the PMDA did not implement SEND yet, but they are going to do it. And um, they, they are taking a different approach. Uh, the FDA said any study that will start after that date will be in scope. And the date is end of this year or end of next year, depending on the type of studies. Uh, what PMDA is doing is saying, okay, if you submit a package after that date, all the studies will need to be compliant. Um, so it's something that, that will be discussed. It's not final yet, but it's interesting because it's changing a little bit the game. What everybody is doing now is to prepare to be sun compliant and end of the year, end of 2016. If you have to submit everything uh, in a package in two years, for example, all the, the preclinical studies, that can be studies that were done 10 years before sometimes. So that's very interesting and that, that was a nice discussion. And finally, I want to mention that one. Actually, there is the AMI2. On here, there is a typo. It's IMI2 coming, which is the Innovative Medicine Initiative in Europe. So it's a lot of money uh, given by the European community, also pharma companies. And one of the consortium will be about sharing data with SEND as a vehicle. So basically as DTM as a vehicle for the data. With pre-competitive sharing, there is already, I don't remember, something like 12 companies, 12 farmers who are in. 
uh, with SMEs, academia, to make sense with the data. So it's very interesting what's happening there, actually. So it's one of the themes that people who have been in the US in the CSS said that there was something different in Europe. We started to discuss about what we are going to do with the data now that we have standards, actually. And uh, it's very interesting. So that was the first breakout. A lot of discussion there. There was a second one, which was a perspective on SEND. It was really about people using SEND today to store data. Uh, and we asked them to explain what's going on, what is good, what is not so great, what are real problems that they have. And um, it was quite interesting. So we had here Bayer, Covance, and Cytox Lab. So Covance and Cytox Lab are CROs. And uh, there was really a great level of openness there. They really share, they did share things that were about, uh, yes, we failed somewhere. And we did learn, and we want you to know where we did fail. And to be honest, we all have the same problems in the same places. So there are things that were discussed, concrete actions, like uh, changing the, the validation rules, for example, for some things. Um, and while there was uh, things that are more soft things that you need to know to, to implement. So very interesting uh, interactive session with many people who, who did share, and that was really a great session also. And then we had something about the future of SEN and the evolution. So we had the, we had the luck to have uh, Luan Kramer in the in the room, and she's one of the main contributors to SEN. So she did uh, explain us what's coming next. So we have uh, a new version of SEN coming, and also new type of studies that will be in scope, like the repro talks on um, the cardio safety things. So it was very interesting, very very uh, very good to have the, the latest news. Um, I did explain what we are doing in Novartis. Uh, for a transactional platform. And um, that's really part of where we go now with SEND, actually. And then we had the final discussion about uh, what we're going to do and what we can do there. So key highlights, a few of them. So the first thing is that we have a, we had a full house there. Uh, we are limited to 17 people. We had 17 people on it, a little bit more, actually, sometimes in the room. Uh, it was not granted for us. We were not sure we'll get a, a community there, and it worked really nicely with people from agencies. So I did cite already the FDA, PMDA. PMDA was remote actually. There was also somebody from uh, from uh, local agencies. So that was that was interesting actually. Sponsors, consultants, IT providers also were there. So it was quite good actually. There was a lot of presentations on um, actually. There was a lot of interactive things because we we are all well we are really a community. We have the same interests. We are playing with the same problems, and uh, that was really very really interesting. So um, we can tell that we we are not able to get somebody from the EMA to come because there is no plan for send at the EMA right now. But well, the regulators in countries are interested, and you may know that the EMA is a bigger machinery than, than the FDA, less centralized, so it takes more time to get them. On them, well, uh, we already got request, request to plan for a new one, actually. So we hope that uh, it will come back next year uh, in Europe for another event of that type. On that note, I'm going to hand over to Chris Price, my presenter. Chris, you should be in. Thank okay, you. Great. Yeah. Great. 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 Okay, can you hear me? We can. Perfect, thank you. Thanks, Chris. So, yes, um, my name is uh, Chris Price. I'm uh, a uh, data science manager at um, Roche in the UK, and I'm co-lead of the um, Future Forum Process uh, Working Group, and we had our f uh, first uh, uh, in-person meeting at the EU uh, CSS back in June. Um, so I'm also representing uh, Shafi Chowdhury as well, who's uh, my co-lead on this project. So this was our first meeting, and really what we wanted to spend most of the meeting doing was brainstorming and identifying challenges relating to processes, what opportunities could we see coming out of those, and uh, really look to identify a couple of projects that we could uh, then start working on to uh, actually deliver some some thoughts uh, regarding uh, processes for uh, 2025. 
And what we really came out with uh, of that was uh, really looking at um, the some foundational pieces that really enable us then to think about what the processes could be. Um, so we identified a number of challenges to start with and uh, I'm sure many will be familiar in terms of uh, the processes around data capture and documentation of data quality, um, maintaining discipline in uh, managing change as well in uh, in our organizations, um, some, some things around data warehousing and then challenges around the processes associated with data privacy and the transfer of data as well. Um, also we looked at uh, quality control, uh, professional development and allowing that uh, to uh, take root as well. Uh, some areas around collaboration, both internal within our own companies and externally um, with uh, other organizations um, through different portals, uh, the CSS being one of those. And also challenges around um, where we actually find information uh, relating to um, projects that uh, we might be working on there. And what came out of that then was a number of opportunities that were uh, identified as what, uh, where there might be areas where we could contribute. Um, the first really was uh, an evaluation of other industries in data processing. So uh, we're all familiar and uh, hearing um, that uh, pharma is um, possibly not the uh, quickest at uh, processing our data. Uh, so is, are there any lessons that we can learn from outside of pharma? Um, also looking at um, some guidelines, there's an opportunity to have some guidelines around the use and reuse of data, processes, documents, all of those different pieces. Also we looked at the idea of defining the role of the data scientist and fortunately this is actually uh, a large part of that piece would already have been done as that's available on the uh, FUSE website uh, with a job spec for a data scientist. So is there somewhere we could take that further um, on that side? Uh, looking at uh, access to health record data, so really thinking about how uh, uh, clinical studies of the future might look and are they going to be more closely related to health record data, wearables and other new technologies. And also is there an opportunity to um, sort of manage standards um, at, at the global level rather than independently at each company, so with each company having their own different implementation of a particular standard. Um, and. Uh, would it actually be better to do that more, much more centrally and uh, more in a more more organised manner? And out of the, out out of all those discussions, I and mean, we had um, about fifteen people in the room uh, throughout uh, the second day, um, sort of everybody really contrib contributing. Um, we had uh, we came out with two proposed projects that we're um, that we're thinking of running uh, or running with. Um, and these were the evaluation of data processes in other industries and the second was uh, the professional development and looking at roles and collaboration uh, piece around there. And I think I said earlier that we're really looking at sort of foundational pieces here um, to guide how we might suggest some real change uh, in the future and the starting point there is to really understand where we are and what skill sets um, are available at the moment, what skill sets might be needed in the future. So the reason we picked the evaluation of data processes in number industry is that um, we realize that um, some or even many of the processes within the farmer industry um, are actually quite long and um, I'm sure we've all encountered that these taken quite a long time to change. Uh, but what we want to be able to do is take, take this opportunity and really see how other industries, both those in regulated and non-regulated uh, spaces, process their data and define their processes around working with data. Um, and also looking at the whole requirements piece in that as well to see, uh, and I think really to share uh, with um, the FUSE members the 
uh, different options that might be out there and then to prompt ideas for future projects of how we might suggest how processes would work in um, 10 years time. For the professional development piece, um, it's obviously vital that it's uh, that the role of a data scientist stays relevant and continues to who evolve from the past where it was program primarily a programming role to where we are in the current status um, in providing much more input into uh, uh, requirements and uh, lots of different uh, tasks as well there. And key to this obviously is to ensure that resources available and has the relevant skill set that fits in there. This obviously is uh, a reasonable overlap with the people side of the uh, future forum, um, but we feel there is a lot of relevance here on the process side to make sure that we have the right people um, to uh, carry out processes, because usually the case is, um, is to find the process and then figure out what skill sets you need to deliver that process, so really try and link those two pieces together. A little bit more detail on each of those uh, individual processes um, for the evaluation of data processes and in other industries. Um, the plan is to really sort of identify some of those industries, um, see if there's actually any existing research out there, um, and then initiate contact with uh, various different contexts within those industries to really establish a report on findings and uh, really put in a set assessment together on how that might be applicable to the farmer industry and there's sort of lots of different areas that you can uh, see there in the slides on how that might um, uh, relate to uh, different areas around data capture, quality control, uh, analysis techniques and tools. Um, so I think there's a lot we can learn from other industries and uh, really use that to help drive uh, the next phase. For professional development and uh, roles and collaboration, I will refer to the data scientist description on the uh, FUSE website. Um, but there's also the opportunity there to look at um, different areas of how to drive different parts of that. So example would be looking at case studies and collaboration um, and start thinking about what skill set might be required for programmers to add value in 2025 um, and see can compare that to the current potential, the current skill set, uh, identifying gaps there, uh, identifying what the current graduate skill set might be, um, and again identifying gaps, and really looking at how that work environment is changing and how that might impact uh, processes. So, with uh, the uh, increase in working uh, from uh, remotely, um, the need for more soft skills, different technical skills, different scientific skills, and how all that might relate on the process side um, and how that might change the way we work um, in the next 10 years. So the next steps um, that we'll be looking at there is really to sort of finalize and flesh out the uh, scope for each of these projects and uh, break down into smaller work groups for each of those. Uh, and then really actually get down to the uh, nitty gritty of actually uh, defining the sections for the white papers and actually then developing those themselves. So there's a lot more work to do um, and uh, uh, I was really pleased with the engagement um, of all those who attended the uh, session uh, at CSS. So I think uh, it's now for me to hand back to uh, you, Chris. Yes, thank you, uh, Chris Price. Multiple Chris's on the phone. Um, yeah, Chris is going to hand back to me, and we're, we're getting near the hour again. To remind people, if you have questions, um, uh, go ahead and enter them in the chat page, or feel free to follow up after the event if you have questions on any of these, and you can contact the co-leads or, or ourselves. Um, uh, so let me just make sure. Chris, before you go on mute, can you, can you see my screen? I want to make sure to confirm that. Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, great. So I'm going to cover uh, the last project, and I'm actually filling in for Scott Malavuni today, who's out, and go over the SDTM Adam FAQ project. So we, as the FUSE steering committee, we meet with F uh, CDISC at least quarterly, if not every other month, to discuss uh, how we align our projects and where CDISC might need help with various projects that, that's not their direct focus of developing standards. So we work together to build a strong partnership uh, and identify these areas where FUSE project could take on 
an activity which, which would be of value. So there was a topic raised uh, actually a year ago and then raised again at the CSS meeting in March about pulling a team together similar to how the, the SEND group did their um, wiki page in terms of identifying an area of um, where we could have SDTM and Adam frequently asked questions. So the team met for the first time uh, in, in, in the Basel event. So it was the project kickoff uh, right before the event and had their first face-to-face -face meeting. And again, this is a joint project uh, sanctioned by CDISC and FUSE uh, that provides standards implementers a forum to really receive coordinated support from CDISC and FUSE SMEs. So the project activities are to collect and curate the questions from industry and regulatory agencies and formulate and, and post those responses. So it's to pull this information together and provide one or more responses to these to these questions and, and issues. Um, the project at the event in Basel discussed a framework for collecting the questions. So how do we get this information in? In the past, I know uh, this this process has been attempted in a number of forums over the years, and probably with not a ton of success. So this group is hoping to learn from the, the past experience and come up with this framework for really collecting this information. Uh, and the team did, over the course of that, that uh, project, document 33 different implementation challenges to start with in terms of a, a starting point for providing those answers and discussion. And within the actual project, they identified four, four new projects within that, which was best practices around SDTM conformance, uh, best practices for finalizing SDTM and Atom data sets for the submission, development of trial design, and working with RELREC. So these are projects that uh, I believe we either have a couple of co-leads on or we're looking for co-leads to help with these, these projects. Um, so it's a, it's a group that started as a, as a FAQ, but has also grown into some of the areas of, that are specific to those implementation challenges that were found. Uh, again, a good collaboration between CDS and FUSE in answering the questions and helping us all implement the data standards in a better way. So again, not my project, so I don't have a, a ton more information than that, but that gives you that sort of high-level introduction to that project. I do want to remind everything, this was a, a poll that we took at the end of our CSS meeting about what was the one word or, or phrase that describes uh, this collaboration and, and or this event, and the word collaboration really stuck out, stuck out for, for everyone. Um, and, and this is one of those tools where people enter collaboration multiple times, it grows and grows. So this is very neat, you know, next to collaboration, Guinness and a burrito, um, that kind of defines Fuse and, and, and who we are. But this was, this was very neat to see and something we uh, share with, with others. Uh, I do want to remind people of the conference in Barcelona coming up um, in October. Uh, it's, it's going quickly, so they're, they're I believe we have over 400 attendees already, and it's it's growing rapidly. So don't be the one that waits till the end, um, because there there won't be room. So please uh, please make sure you sign up. We'll have a session, a discussion club uh, on these um, projects at that event, uh, as well as uh, ongoing discussions across all the projects uh, that Fuse is working on. Uh, and just to put this on everybody's calendar for next year. Um, we will have the Computational Science Symposium next March the 19th through the 21st, again in Silver Spring. Uh, again, this, this is an event that we limit to 300 attendees. Uh, this year we sold out again, so again, when that comes online November 1st, uh, I'd encourage people to sign up and uh, submit a poster. Um, that's another a great event to submit a poster at uh, about the work you're doing within your company. And finally, I just want to uh, come back to these quotes. As you think about your, your, these groups and how you can get involved and how you can change things, uh, at the end of the day, you know, change is impossible without this collaboration, without cooperation, uh, and we can't move these things forward. So I encourage everybody to, um, to contribute, uh, even a little bit, uh, helps us to, to push this, these ideas forward. So I think that's it. Yeah, and just a reminder, again, this was a picture that was shared with us at the, at the conference in Basel um, uh, about the fight against Ebola. Uh, this is why we work on drugs, to help people uh, get better. So I'm going to, we're, we're up against the hour. Um, I do have just a few minutes. I will check the page here and see 
if there are a few questions. Um, I'm hearing there's no questions, so again, thanks for attending today, and thank you to all our speakers for taking the time out of their day to, to put this together. Uh, if you're interested in any of these, uh, or if your company is, please share this. This recording of this session will be up on our website probably within the week. Um, share it with your colleagues, and if those that are interested in participating in any of our groups, reach out and let us know, and, and we're happy to uh, sync you up, and we always want volunteers to push this, these efforts forward. So again, thank you for today, and we will, we will sign off now.